Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome to this Poetry Translation Center event, which we're holding to celebrate two of the brilliant titles on the shortlist for this year's Sarah Maguire Prize for Poetry in Translation. My name is Rosalind Harvey, and I'm chair of the judges. And with us tonight, we're joined by Fiston Wanzamujila, author of River in the Belly, and his translator, Jay Brett Maney, and Nancy Naomi Carlson, the translator of Carl Torribulli's work, Cargo Hold of Stars, Coolitude. Cal can't be with us this evening, sadly, but he has sent a video, which we'll play a little later on, so you'll get a chance to hear from him as well. The Sarah Maguire Prize is in its second year now. It was created after Sarah's sad death in 2017 as a way to honour her legacy, both as a poet translator and also as the founder of the Poetry Translation Centre. And it aims to recognise and celebrate the best book of poetry translated into English from a living poet from Africa, Asia, Latin America or the Middle East. I think like many people, I turned to poetry more than anything during the pandemic. And I read more of it than ever before, even before I was asked to, to chair this, this prize. It felt like it was the only medium that was really suitable to contain or, um, or respond to the, all of the new feelings of uncertainty and loss and adriftness on a grand scale that COVID brought with it and which a lot of us I think are still feeling um, and reading poetry for me um, I'd always read a little bit of poetry but I leaned more towards reading reading prose but during the pandemic reading poetry it felt like it provided a space where questioning was was more important or as important than finding any kind of answers in what we in what we were reading it was a hugely difficult task um, but thankfully I was joined in the task of judging the prize by Kit Fan and Q Lee. Kit is a poet, novelist and critic, and Q is a professor of philosophy, gender studies and women's studies, while I'm a translator, writer and teacher of various things. So amongst the three of us, we had a really good spread of abilities and interests that we brought to the judging table. And that judging table always felt like a really collaborative space. And that, in fact, that's one of the things that I love the most about the Sarah Maguire Prize, um, that it celebrates translators alongside their authors, that it focuses on this very particular form of writing that we know to be highly collaborative. And it's a form that often makes more visible than usual its multi-authored status. And as a result, it can allow us quite frequently, the readers, to, the chance to add our own collaborative footprint to the process. I'll be asking a few questions about this kind of collaboration after we've had readings from each of the books tonight. Um, and I also hope that you, the audience, might also feel like collaborating as well towards the end when we'll have around 10 minutes or so for you to ask any of your own questions. There should be a Q&A section that you can see in Zoom, so pop your questions in there. Um, if you can't see that, but then you can just pop them in the chat. I think that should also be available for people attending the webinar. What makes for a good poem in translation is very hard to define, as we found during the judging process. Um, but it felt like there were two elements, two main elements to the task that we had. One, what makes for a good poem, also very difficult to answer. And two, what makes for a good translation. When we had our early judging meetings, we discussed what our criteria might be, and we were able to isolate a few aspects that we would at least aim to bear in mind while we were reading and rereading and rereading. And two of these things were linguistic inventiveness or something that Sarah Maguire quite enjoyably described as gingering up the English language. The second thing was we were looking to come across collections where the reader is ushered into a whole new world that has its own internal logic. Um, poetry that allows you as a reader to almost to learn a new language or to show to show you a new way of seeing the world. And both of the collections that we're going to be hearing from tonight have those two aspects, along with many others in spades. The River in the Belly is made up of 101 solitudes, which is an invention of Fiston's, of the authors. 
and they lead us through places as diverse as Minsk, Seville and Zambia, to name just a few, while remaining very much centred on the Democratic Republic of Congo and its river. Some of these solitudes are very short, they almost feel like aphorisms, um, while others are, are prose poem-esque and they last for several pages, they have a feel almost of a short story to them. It's a collection that's marked by multilingualism and linguistic and formal inventiveness, and it aims, as the translator notes, to reinitiate the Congo River in the imaginary of European languages. The stars, Coolitude, just like River in the Belly, very much ticked all of the judges' boxes in terms of being poetry that allows us access to a new world and teaches us a new language. And Torabuli has referred to this language as new French. So French with, for instance, Mauritian Creole, Hindi, wordplay, amazing neologisms woven throughout and beautifully brought into English by Carlson. The collection has been described as an ode to the forgotten voyage of a forgotten people. And it reformulates the story of the indentured workers brought to Mauritius and other European colonies from India and China. We're going to start off um, by looking at River in the Belly. So I'll just briefly introduce the author and translator, and then we have 15 minutes for readings. And I think Fiston, you're going to read in French, and Brett, you're going to read your translations. Um, Fiston Mwanza Mujila is a poet, playwright, and novelist, and the author of River in the Belly. His novel, Tram 83, was nominated for the Man Booker Prize and has received numerous other awards. He was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo and lives in Graz, Austria, where he teaches African literature amongst other activities and also works with musicians on various projects. J. Brett Maney, the translator of The River in the Belly, is a literary critic and translator from French and Spanish. He's a recipient of several awards, including the 2020 Gulf Coast Translation Prize for his translations of Mwanza Mujilo's poetry, and an International Latino Book Award and Penheim Translation Fund grant for his translation of Guillermo Cotodorno's novel, Manhattan Tropics. He's assistant professor of English at Lehman College, City University of New York. So over to you both. Thank you so much, Rosalind, and, uh, and to the, the other members of the jury for uh, shortlisting this text. And uh, we're going to begin um, with uh, reading several poems uh, from the text. One of them is included in the anthology um, that the Sarah McGuire, uh, the Sarah McGuire Prize anthology that the Poetry Translation Center um, has, uh, has published. Um, and we will read the text in, in French um, and uh, uh, Fistone will do that, and then I will read my translations, and we will begin with uh, a Solitude 41. Um, and Fistone, I will, I will let you take it from there. La Solitude uh, 41. Solitude 41. Je ne suis pas le premier à quitter le continent. Mon exil. <laughs> Mon exil ne sera pas l'exil d'une race. Et même si je crève ce matin à Minsk ou en début d'après-midi à Vladivostok, je n'aurai droit ni à une ville morte, ni à un deuil national. Je ne vois que ma mère seule languir et larmoyer et quelques amis se chagriner le saumon. Le fleuve Congo continuera à se virée nocturne dans l'Ouélé et le Bazaïr, les usines de cuivre tourneront dans le Katanga. Les adultes et enfants soldats en mal de sexe, ivres de sang et autres fellations vagueront à leurs moutons entre Bouta et Isiro. Et le train marchandise, <rire> et le train marchandise, et le train marchandise partiront de Musumba en Gada jusqu'en en passant par Ilebo, Kassangulu, Loambo, Loja et Kamituga. Solitude 41, this time in English. I'm not the first to leave the continent. My exile won't be the exile of my race. Even if I die today in Minsk or an early afternoon in Vladivostok, 
No city will fall quiet, no nation will mourn. I see only my mother crumple, her eyes tear up. A few friends get knots in their stomachs. The Congo River will run its nightly course in Uwele and Bazaire. The copper factories will hum in Katanga. The grown up and child soldiers aching for sex, drunk on blood and head, will shepherd their flocks between Buta and Isiro. And the freight trains will depart from Usumba to Ngandajika, passing through Ilebo, Kasanguru, Wambo, Loja, and Kamituga. Solitude 44, qu'il salomodie le Brahma Poutre, qu'il exhibe le Yang Se Kiang, qu'ils en cessent le Zambèze, qu'ils affichent le Frat, qu'ils pérorent la Meuse, qu'ils chantent le Guadalquivir, qu'ils élisent le Mississippi et ses gendres, à savoir l'Arkansas, le Missouri et l'Oyo. Je brandirai le Congo, le seul fleuve qui déconcentre, le seul fleuve qui simule la tuberculose, le seul fleuve qui danse le tango, la salsa, le boléro, le flamenco et le cha-cha-cha, le seul fleuve qui réchigne. Le seul fleuve qui broute de la viande, le seul fleuve qui se suicide dans l'océan, jambes croisées, bras croisés. Je donnerai ma main à couper, mon cou à trancher et mon corps à castrer s'il s'avère que je fais usage de faux. Déjà, je suis castré et minable tel le limpopo à ses heures perdues. En tout état de cause, que craindrais-je La masturbation forcée, le preuve du Kambi ou l'assassinat déguisé en noyade dans les eaux troubles de ce même fleuve In many ways, the Congo River is the protagonist of this book, or one of its protagonists. And the, the next three poems that we've chosen to read, uh, beginning with Solitude 44, which Fiston just read, um, bring to life and uh, that, that, that protagonist, the river. So uh, Solitude 44. Let him praise the Brahmaputra. Let him write home about the Yangtze. Let him acclaim the Zambezi. They can flaunt the Euphrates, go on about the Muz, sing the Guadalquivir, elect the Mississippi and its sons-in-law, the Arkansas, Missouri, and Ohio. I brandish the Congo, the only river that saps your concentration, the only river that fakes tuberculosis, the only river that dances the tango and salsa and bolero and flamenco and the cha-cha-cha, the only river that thumbs its nose at you, the only river that eats meat, the only river that offs itself in the ocean, legs together, arms crossed. I'll give you my hand to cut off, my neck to wring, my body to castrate if what I say isn't true. In any case, I'm already castrated, a sad sack like the Limpopo in its spare hours. In any case, what? Do I have to fear forced masturbation, the Kiambi test, or murder disguised as drowning in the waters of this very river? Solitude 23. Mon premier rêve était de faire carrière comme saxophoniste. <coughs> Mon dernier rêve, devenir un fleuve, le Congo ou le Niger, qu'importe, et passer calmement mes journées loin de ce guerre que vous exportez et de ces famines qui font de vous de Père Noël intemporel et autres bons samaritains. Le théâtre! <rire>
Le le théâtre dans tout ça, vous offrez avec la main gauche et vous arrachez avec la main droite. Le théâtre dans tout ça, vous donnez avec le deux mains, galeuse d'ailleurs. Puis vous courez raconter vos inepties de sauveur de l'humanité et autres somnambules de Père Noël envoyés expressement sur terre pour nous aider avec du riz, du savon, du sel, de l'huile de palme, de la farine de manioc, de capote et du jus de juju. <rire> Le théâtre dans tout ça vous maintenez l'absurde et le théâtre de l'absurde et le théâtre de l'absurde. Solitude 23. My first dream was to play sax, my last to become a river, the Congo or the Niger, little it matters, and spend my days at peace, far from these wars you export and these famines that let you play at being proverbial Santa Clauses and good Samaritans. What an act. You give with the left hand what you snatch away with the right. What an act. You give with both hands, scabby ones besides, and then you run to brag of your exploits as saviors of humanity and sleepwalking Santa Clauses, expressly put in the face of the earth to grant us rice, soap, salt, palm oil, cassava flour, condoms, and juju juice. What an act. You keep up the absurd and this theater of the absurd. Solitude 61. Dans mon ventre, 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 ce qu'on vu sans fleuve, vous grand, fainéant, sale, immense, lugubre. Lugubre, lugubre, lugubre vilain dans mon ventre, ce cromule sans fleuve, bourgre, fainéant, sale et immense, lugubre, vilain, lugubre, vilain, lugubre, vilain, un fleuve, un fleuve. Un fleuve, 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 This is uh, Solitude 61, which Fiston just read, and it's also the first solitude of the book. Uh, it's very short, actually. You wouldn't know that from listening to Fiston uh, give the, the performance he just gave. But I mean, as he said elsewhere, uh, he uses words like musical notes. And so this, this text, this poem 61, uh, serves as a kind of musical notation or, or a kind of script from which performances uh, can, can, can be called forth, elicited, like the one that you just saw. So I'm gonna read that, 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 that script for you. Um, uh, Solitude 61. In my belly, a river convulses, a confounded malingerer, dirty and immense, mournful 
and malign a river in the last stages of dysentery. That's Solitude 61. Thank you. Those are the, the four poems that, that we uh, elected to read for you tonight. Um, and perhaps we can return to some more later, time permitting. Thank you. Back to you, Rosalind. Thank you so much. I think that's the first poetry reading I've attended, which features a kazoo, and I sincerely hope it's not the last one. <laughs> that was incredible. Thank you both for your readings. Um, we'll move now on to our second book of the evening. Um, there'll be questions, space for questions at the end, and yeah, maybe some more time for some readings if, if people have, have other poems that they want to read. Um, so here we have with us Nancy Naomi Carlson, the translator of Cargo Hold of Stars, Coolitude. Carlson is a poet, translator, and essayist based in Maryland, winner of the 2022 Oxford Weidenfeld Translation Prize. Congratulations, Nancy. And decorated with the French academic palms and twice a recipient of NEA literature translation grants. She's also the translation editor for On the Seawall. Cal Torribulli, is a prize-winning poet, essayist, film director, and semiologist from Mauritius. He's the author of some 25 books and coined the term coolitude to give voice to indentured workers. His work has been praised by none other than Amé Silzer, Martinique's great poet, for containing all of my humanity. And I think we have a recording um, of Cal reading some of his work now that will be played and uh, he will read in French and Nancy will read her translations afterwards. Thank you, Rosalind, for the introduction and thank you to you and the jury for bringing us here shortlisted on this amazing award. Um, that's a tough act to follow with such a dramatic reading. I'm, 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 I, I wish Colin were here, but he will be here on, on recordings. Um, and, and you gave a great background of what Kyle is trying to do, where he's bringing voice, giving voice to millions of men and women who were indentured workers at the turn of the century, brought over from China or, or India in, in ships, sometimes tricked into indenture, uh, then sent to colonies, many dying in the cargo holds of ships where they were thrown into. Um, and, and then on the sugarcane plantations, the arduous conditions, the violence, the separation of families. Yet, Carl, as you mentioned, has coined this term coolitude to imbue the term, that pejorative term coolie, with dignity and honor the way Aimé Cézelle coined the, the term, or in a similar way, coined the term negritude. And um, what he does is he, he focuses on these voices, and then he, he talks about, with the title of the book, that the indentured workers could look up from the cargo hold and see the stars. So it's uh, some of the work is very similar in, in theme, in, in the way of handling a violent, terrible theme, um, with musicality, with sounds, with playful rhymes. But underneath the surface is this horrible history that many people have forgotten. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to have Carl read a poem, the first poem, and you'll hear um, I do some sound, I do a strategy called sound mapping to get these sounds and alliterations. I can't get the exact ones, but in this case, I did get a C alliteration. So you'll hear when Carl reads this first poem without titles, um, how he gets at that C alliteration, and then you'll hear my translation. Le langage marcouli pour conception. Mots de ma salive, coulés purs, coulés sales, coups liés. L'eau pure ignore les sangs, coulés, calés, calqués. Devinez mes prochains itinéraires et ma vraie moisson d'images de mer. 
Thank you, Tom. Language has coolied me for conception, word of my spit. Pure cascade, mixed cascade, casket bound. Pure water pays no attention to bloodlines. Cast, clasped, cloned. Guessing at what my next roots will be is my true harvest of maritime dreams. And in this next one, Carl's going to read sur le varang. Varang, Carl likes to have zillions of meanings for the same word, um, you know, polysemy with these words that he uses, trying to render that into English, sometimes just going with the word that he uses. And with a handy dandy translator's notes at the back of the book, the varang is a French word as well as a Hindi word that means veranda. It also refers to the floor plate of a boat situated perpendicularly over the keel. Sur la varangue, ma langue cherche une mangue. Petite lune sur ma de une, me harangue. Raconte ma traversée coulissante. Au coulis, palant, poulet. Dix lumières pour vérité. Sur la varangue, la mangue sous ma langue, je manque à l'appel, mon cœur tangue. Comment guider le gouvernail et donner ta chair à toute rive, à des rives, à tes rêves Au coulis, palant, coulis. Réduisez la voilure. Casser le vent de mémoire effilochée, par cœur arraché. Je connais ce chant, je connais l'Odyssée. Ô oh, coulis, palant, colis. On the barang, my tongue seeks a mango, and I'm harangued by a small topmast moon. Tell the tale of my curried crossing. O oh, capstan, pulley, coolie, say light for truth. On the varang, mango under my tongue, I miss roll call. My heart reels. How to steer the rudder and give your flesh to all shores, all drifts, to your dreams. O oh, coolie, capstan, coolie. Reef the sails, break the wind of memories frayed by uprooted hearts. I know this song, I know the Odyssey. Oh, crating, capstan, coolie. The next one speaks for itself about Kaum and his mother. A mes grands-parents. Si seulement ma mère m'avait parlé de la mer, même un soir de mousson, quand sur le toit le goémon se plaignait à la faux du vent. Mais la pauvre femme sentait la terre jusqu'à son sang, et pour faire descendre la nuit sur nos yeux, elle se levait pour toucher la figue, le citron, la menthe, sa douce potion. Si seulement la terre pouvait me dire parole de mère. Pourtant, elle me parla un soir d'un grand monstre au corail accouché de vilaines vagues, d'une profondeur plus abyssale que notre sombre couloir. Aux vagues, elle me dit, tu t'emportes. Au corail, elle me dit, tu t'empales. Aux algues, elle me dit, tu t'affales. Et pourtant, sur le toit, à l'en croire, un bateau se renverse à chaque rafale. Et pourtant, dans sa voix, à la voir, les matelots ont d'étranges cris pour mémoire. For my grandparents. 
If only my mother had told me about the sea, even on a monsoon evening when, on the roof, the kelp was sighing under the wind's scythe. But the poor woman felt the earth down to her blood, and to make the night fall in our eyes, she would rise to reach fig, lemon, mint, her sweet potion. If only the earth could tell me the words of the sea. Yet one night she spoke of a great coral monster, birthed by dreadful waves of a depth more abyssal than our murky hallway. She told me you lose your temper at waves. She told me you get impaled on coral. She told me you run yourself aground on algae. And yet on the roof, if she's to be believed, a boat capsizes with each gust of wind. And yet, as she tells it, when she's seen, seamen remember her strange screams. I think we'll read one more. Um, this one is in English is My Skin Sings, and it's one of the prose poems in the book that are sprinkled throughout, and they're they're easier to translate because there's less going on there, but it grounds the reader in what's happening with the narrative. Here's Carl. My skin sings more than I do. That's why I was born in a country whose name is inscribed in the sea. My skin speaks more quickly than my voice. It truly weighs me down. That's why my cries are the backwash of men captured by silk, exiled by nutmeg, and rooted by sugar, by islands and colonies. My skin is caulking for my flesh and all the memories carried by pitching mast. My song is therefore coolie. My coolitude is my only share of a memory tossed by the waves. In the wakes of boats, sowing men at the end of the world, I want to speak of my task as a man and my flesh of ink. For my words were watching as open-hulled ships sailed by. And that concludes our reading, hearing the translation in Kyle's voice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy and Kyle, for those, those wonderful lyrical readings. And please convey our thanks to Kyle when you can as well. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to start by asking you a question, I think, given you're fresh, fresh from reading. Um, you, you referred when you were talking about your process just then to, to the sound mapping technique, which you describe um, you describe really well in your forward to the book. Can you talk a little bit more about what that process involves and what what is it about Carl Torrigulli's work that calls out for that for that particular approach? Is it something that you you use in general, or did you devise it for his work particularly? Yeah. I guess I'm unmuted, yes? Yes. Good. Uh, so this is something that I tend to do and I look for lyrical texts because I used to be a musician and to me hearing the music of poetry, the lyricism, um, Kyle's just finished the debut novel and it's a lyric novel. I will have to sound map the entire novel. But I choose the, po the poetry to translate based on what I see as musicality. And then I color coordinate the assonances, the, um, the alliterations, the silences that are there. Then I block in special gray the wordplay. That's part of the sound mapping. Um, he, he just plays around with switching switching around consonants to have different words and meanings. And so then I look at the whole. And once I've done that, I look to see what's the most salient pattern because I can't possibly bring 
all the music into the English or even a fraction of it actually with sounds because of some of the sounds that don't even exist in, in English, the, the nasalities in French, the on and the on. And then um, I, I pick, well, I have to just, I have to find something for this. And sometimes it would take, it took four years to translate the book. I would go to sleep on it. I would uh, walk around thinking about it. Um, I couldn't go on until I puzzled this out. And um, I hope that you were able to hear in both the French and the English, the texture of sound that um, overlays the meaning. And yet I tried to stay as close to the meaning as possible, which, uh, Sometimes translators choose to cut themselves loose a little bit and just go with that, that sound there um, as the most important thing. And I can't say I never did that when the sound just seemed to demand to be there and letting go of some of the literalness because the literalness was playful anyway. And then in neologisms, it's anyone's, um, anybody's, choice about what does this mean? It's a made up word anyway. So I got to make up these words. Um, yes, but that, that, that's something that um, makes the translation process even more challenging, but even more delightful when I can find a solution to it. Thank you. That's, that's a really fascinating insight into your process. And I feel like I would love to see these maps that you create. They sound, I mean, it sounds like a very visual process as well as sonic. Um, I, I wonder if you've patented it as, as an approach. Uh, I, I've written a few essays about it, but um, sometimes I'm stymied by the journals not doing color. And I don't think it does justice to the sound mapping without the example with the, the bright colors that, mm -hmm. that stand out there. Um, so maybe I will find a journal at one point that will do so. <laughs> I hope you can, because I'd love to see them. I'd love to see them published alongside your work and Carl's work. I think that would make for a wonderful addition with you know, his original, your translations, and then a, a visual representation of this sound mapping technique, which sounds, yeah, I, I'm really drawn to it as an approach. Thank you. Um, you have another phrase in your forward, which is to do with um, Carl's poetry being dialogical in spirit. Can you talk a little bit more about that and also where translation fits in to that, to that dialogue? So with, with the indentured workers speaking to one another, speaking to us now in the present, their voices are still alive and that's what Carl is, is trying to have, for us to continue that dialogue about what they're speaking about. Um, I, 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 th I think the beauty of the dialogue is that here, imagine that ship crossing and the cargo hold and men and women from all castes are thrown into the same cargo hold using the same utensils, using the same, uh, sleeping in the same poor quarters and yet, and not speaking the same languages. And yet they were able to find a way to communicate with one another and get this new identity is how Carl looks at it, where you get the best of all worlds there into a stronger and more resilient identity um, from their interaction with one another and both and everyone going through the same experience. Um, yeah. And has, has his work been translated into other languages? Um, and were you, if so, were you in, in contact, were you in dialogue with those other translators? Your questions are quite good. Um, <laughs> isn't it time to talk to Brett? Um, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll leave it this one, but I, I am interested yeah. to know how much of, how much crossover there is in this process where the work fans out and goes, goes across different borders into different languages. So in, in honesty, to my knowledge, um, the poetry has never been translated into any other language, never before in English. And I, I just, I found Carl in an anthology, a wonderful anthology, The Parlay Tree uh, by Patrick Williamson with, with maybe 10 or 12 or 15 um, African voices and I was drawn to his work and the, the, the lyricism and the sea imagery. 
And um, I looked around to see what was out there. And I thought, you know, I want to bring this book in English. Now, Carl speaks English, as you heard. And there's an anthology that he and Marina Carter, um, a researcher at the University of, in Scotland, and they translated parts of it for the anthology. But they, if Carl were here, he would, he would say that I did justice to his words in a way that he hadn't envisioned. Um, and so there, there's that out there, but I, I, feel, I feel really happy that his words are getting out there, especially because English is the language that's spoken in Mauritius. Most of the population um, comes from India because of the history, but they speak so many languages and um, this way the rest of the world gets to, to hear his words and it's not localized um, in Mauritius and, and Carl has strong ties to Spain as well. And so I, I don't want to, I'm not going to swear that there's nothing that's ever been out there in Spanish, but certainly with some authors, you get the Spanish version and then you go, oh God, I can consult with them and see how they, they handle that. But there was nothing. Thank you. Yeah, so any translators listening from the French into languages other than English, then definitely worth, worth the punt. It would be lovely to see this work in, in some other languages. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate your answers. Um, Fiston and Brett, uh, I, I have some questions for you. Um, I have some for you, Fiston, and I have, I have at least one for you, Brett. But I wanted to start off by asking about the, the structure of River in the Belly. Um, reading it, I immediately thought of a favorite collection of mine, which is Dart by Alice Oswald, another, another river, um, river focused collection. Um, one that also features multiple voices, which she has woven into the, into the structure of, of the collection, multiple sounds. Um, and I wanted to ask, what's, what's the process for you when you write of, of ordering the sections? The solitudes come out of order, as it were, the, the numbers aren't in order. Is that something that, you've, that, that you have already conceived of in your mind as you're writing, or do you write and shift the sections around? Does it happen organically? Can you talk a little bit about, about how the book takes shape? Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. I speak uh, a lot of language, French, Swahili, German, uh, Lingala, Chiluba, uh, and so on. But I would like to 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 answer in in today. Uh, um, I like to answer to in, in German or in French. But I, I'll do in French, and Brett can translate. Okay. Yeah, uh, ouais. Au fait, pour moi, c'est uh, uh, quand j'écris de la poésie, uh, je fonctionne comme un comme un musicien de jazz, uh, comme un musicien de free jazz. Donc, je laisse beaucoup d'espace à l'improvisation, à la spontanéité. So, uh, Fiston said that when he writes, he writes like a musician, and specifically like a, like a free jazz musician, that when he writes, he leaves a lot of space for improvisation, which I'll, I'll just add, as you clearly saw in particular in that last poem that we read. Oui, et donc, pour moi, c'est qui, qui, le rythme, uh, le rythme vient dans l'ordonnancement de poèmes est influencé non pas par l'écriture mais par le rythme ou l'oralité ou la performance. That, that for Fiston, the questions of orality and performance, that the writing really begins there. Um, and uh, in, in those questions about order uh, begin or respond to uh, matters of orality and performance. Et donc pour moi, il n'y a pas de texte, de texte définitif. L'oralité ou la performance est le prolongement de l'écriture. Parce que le texte comme tel est une prison. Parce que quand on écrit, les mots restent cloisonnés. Les mots restent dans un état de, de, de l'abrément. Ils sont morts. Et donc ils ont besoin d'un poète pour le, pour le faire revivre. So, writing, um, when he writes or, or when... The, write, the writing itself is kind of a, a prolongation or, 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 or the performance, the writing is a pro, the prolongation of these questions of, 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 of the orality, that the written word 
um, is in a way um, inhibited. Um, and then the performance is, is, is a way of, of opening up, of, of releasing it, um, of its releasing its potentials. That's an approximate uh, in a translation, but um, of what Fiston is just saying. Et donc, l'ordonnance le, 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 de poème est influencée par l'image du fleuve. C'était important pour moi d'avoir cette image du fleuve qui, euh, qui, qui commence à la source, qui évolue et qui se déferse ou qui, qui se suicide dans l'océan. Et donc, pour moi, j'ai toujours été passionné par, par l'image du fleuve parce que pour moi, le fleuve ne se jette pas dans l'océan, il se suicide dans l'océan. Et donc, pour moi, c'était important d'avoir cette image-là de, d un, d un, des mots qui commencent petit à petit et qui, qui, qui grandissent comme, comme un fleuve. So the ordering of the poem in, in a way for, for Fiston, particularly in this text, uh, has to do with the, the course of the river um, and the course of the, of the Congo River, which begins as a very slow moving river. And so the words too uh, begin uh, slowly, uh, one by one. Um, and then at, at the very end, the, the Congo River is amazingly deep, amazingly fast, and goes over all of these cascades, and, and as he says, commits suicide in the ocean, uh, a frequent image within this text. And so the, the order of the poems uh, responds to those, 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 those rhythmic demands, but also those demands of, of the kind of current, the current of the river. Et donc, quand j'ai fini l'écriture, déjà, en écrivant le texte, j'ai lisé régulièrement ce que j'écrivais. Et quand j'ai fini tout le texte, j'ai lu le texte du début jusqu'à la fin pour trouver un rythme. Et j'ai lu sans arrêt pendant au moins presque dix heures du temps. J'ai repris tout le texte pour trouver le, le rythme. Et à la fin, c'est comme si je m'étais suicidé parce que j'étais épuisé. C'est comme si j'étais le fleuve. Et donc, pour moi, il y a à, quand je lis, il y a un point comme, en fait, quand je dis mes textes, euh, donc c'est comme si j'étais, quand je dis ce, ce, ce recueil, c'est comme si j'étais un fleuve. Et donc pour moi, l'oralité est très importante, le, le, le travail de, de la performance est très important et elle influence le rythme. So, uh, Fiston, as he, as he writes, as he wrote this text, he revises as he goes along. Uh, but then at the end, when he's finished, he says, and this is, this is remarkable, he reads the text straight uh, in an ongoing manner for uh, 10 hours. Um, and that process of reading and reading and reading and reading is itself almost like a form of, of suicide, uh, a form of becoming river, of becoming flow. Um, and and, and that there, in, that, in that way, he arrives at, at a kind of a final form et donc je laisse pour, pour finir c'est la, la première question je laisse beaucoup de, de la place à l'improvisation et à la spontanéité et donc quand je dis mes textes je ne suis pas seul sur scène je suis accompagné de mon père de ma mère de mes frères de mes soeurs du, du fleuve Congo des forêts des savanes ce qui fait que c'est pas seulement moi qui dis le texte on est plusieurs un village un monde apporter cette voix de, 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 de colonisés, des gens qui ont été déportés, de, de des gens qui meurent dans les, les mines, dans les éboulements. Euh, donc, euh, pour moi, c'est la performance et le, 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 la poésie, en fait, c'est comme si c'était un requiem, comme si c'était euh, euh, une forme de raison funèbre. Et donc, il faudrait quand tu. Il faut, et donc, pour moi, c'est important de, de, de se laisser emporter et de faire confiance à, aux personnages qui vivent en nous, aux ancêtres qui vivent en nous, aux morts qui vivent en nous et aux enfants qui naîtront après des milliers d'années. So, when Fiston reads uh, this text, when he reads his poetry, he's not reading alone, he's reading with his father, uh, with, his, with his mother. With his father, I'll say the, the, the English text was, was dedicated to his father's memory. Um, he's reading with his father, with his mother, um, with, his, with his brother, with his sisters, with the river, with the equatorial forest. He's reading with colonized peoples. He's reading with deported peoples. He's reading with people who died in the mines. And that part of why he trusts himself when he reads is so that the poem 
will f will flow. He allows himself to be taken by the poem so that those voices can emerge uh, from the performance, uh, from the script on, on the page um, and, and become present within uh, uh, the, 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 the scene of performance itself. Thank you so much for those incredibly rich answers. Um, I'm conscious of the time and I wonder if we have any questions from people in the audience. Um, I can't see anything in the Q&A or in the chat, but if anyone does have any questions they'd like to ask any of our panelists, do pop them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and if no one has any questions, I have a few more as chair, which I can sneakily ask. Um, or perhaps we can have another reading if there's time. I think Brett and Fiston, you mentioned maybe there was something else you'd like to read from, but we'll wait and see if any questions appear from our audience members. Any takers? Okay, perhaps not. Well, Fiston and Brett, would you like to re do another reading? Oui, on peut improviser, Brett, tu, tu voudrais qu'on lise quel, quel texte? Uh, Peut-être le 47, 47. Um, Quelle page? One, uh, one of the, for, for our, our listeners today, one of the um, pragmatic or unpragmatic aspects of producing a text in which the solitudes are numbered, but in no, in, in no discernible order, um, although they do uh, comply with a kind of logic, is that they're extremely hard to find um, a particular a particular text. Um, while you're looking for it, Fistone, if you like, I can read it in English. Um, and I know uh, Asymptote published this poem, um, so it, it's available online if you're unable to find it. Great, right. thanks. thanks, Brett. And, uh, and I think there is one other poem from Carl as well. So if, if you two can do your reading and then we'll we'll play the final poem from Carl. And if Nancy, would you'd like to read your translation of the final poem, then I think that will take us up to time. Thank you. Marvelous. Um, okay, so let me, let me read it in English first this time. Okay. Solitude 47. Not, not blood, but the Congo River sloshes in my veins. If you deny it, if you have your doubts, if you don't believe me, take up a sharp object, a steak knife or bayonet will do, and cut me open, slice me up, skin me from belly to belly, from head to foot. You'll see what you see, the left leg of the river where my guts should be. Didn't they tell you, after all, my mouth stinks of Lake Munkamba, once infected with schistosomiasis? Didn't they tell you the Yiragongo beats in place of my heart? Didn't they tell you my hair is the equatorial forest? Didn't they tell you my tears are lava from Yamulagira and my laughter is the gusts that blow in Mweniditu in Kanyama Kasese? If in uh, talking about in Nancy's um, comments, there's a, was sound mapping. Uh, there's there's a way in in this work by Fistone in which the river itself and in the geography of the DRC is is mapped onto the body as well. And of course, the body is 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 mapped onto the river. Uh, so now we'll hear a solid, solitude 47 uh, from Fistone in, in the original. <laughs> Solitude 47. Ce n'est pas du sang qui coule, mais plutôt le fleuve Congo qui dégringole dans mes veines. Si vous niez, si vous doutez, si vous rechignez, prenez alors un outil tranchant, un couteau à viande ou une baïonnette et frappe. Fais-moi et ouvrez-moi le corps et écorche-moi la peau du ventre au ventre, de la tête aux pieds. Vous verrez ce que vous verrez. La jambe gauche du fleuve en lieu et place de mes tripes. Ne vous attend pas dit que ma bouche fut le lac mon combat jadis infesté de bilarioses. Ne vous attend pas dit que c'est le Niragongo qui bat à la place de mon cœur. 
Seigneur vous a donc pas dit que c'est la forêt équatoriale qui fait office de ma chevelure. Ne vous a-t-on pas dit que mes larmes sont les larmes du Niamoladira et que me rire <rire> et que me rire correspond aux bourrasques qui soufflent sur au moyen du tout et qu'il m'a cassé ce... <rire> Uh, je, je peux ajouter quelque chose? Go ahead. Uh, en fait, ouais, pour moi, le, le rire fait partie de la poésie. Donc, je ris contre le colonialisme, je ris contre l'esclavage, je ris contre le néocolonialisme, je ris contre l'exploitation des enfants soldats, je ris contre l'exploitation des enfants qui travaillent dans les mines, j'ai ri contre tous les systèmes d'oppression. Et donc pour moi, le rire est une délivrance, c'est une planche de salut. Il n'y a que le rire qui, euh, qui fait office pour moi d'une un, forme de, de transcendance contre la mort, contre la malédiction. Feaststone said at the end there um, that uh, that laughter um, is. Let's see if I can read my handwriting. Um, that laughter is he when he laughs. He laughs. Um, he laughs against slavery. He laughs against colonization. He laughs against the exploitation of child soldiers. He laughs against children in the mines. He, it, his laughter for him is, is a way, is a form of, against systems of oppression. Um, that to laugh for him is in fact a kind of form of, of deliverance. It's, it's a form of, of, of transcendence, in fact, in the face of death. And that is why laughter, how, it, how the role it plays in, in his poetry, that it comes from the poems, he said at the very beginning of his, of his comments, out of the poems. Thank you so much. That's very powerful. It's nice to have laughing and, and kazoos in the middle of the reading. <laughs> uh, are we able to play the recording of Carl's final poem just to, to finish up? I was thinking that uh, rather than playing that, I would read one more in French. Um, Perfect. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and, and in the spirit of laughing at deeply tragic work and concepts, um, this is call it his best, which in French, a lot of M sounds. And to know this, um, Malabar is an inhabitant of the Malabar coast in India. And mutai is one of those sweets that are circular and steeped in, in a sugary syrup. Malabar, me of the spar, me mound of dirt, me of salt, me of flesh, my worn out Lascar soul, quarter melee, third malaise, will be fragments, broken cross beams of sky, body broken from setting sail. To be a mutai, I'll be undone over there, malady of mind, maligned malai, malayalam, alone me will be lost, me so right, left to rot, O oh memory. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, what a way to end, we are, we are just at the end, but I'd like to thank all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you, Fiston, thank you, Brett, and thank you, Nancy, for joining and for giving us um, such incredibly powerful readings. Um, thanks everyone in the audience for listening, and I really encourage you all to, to check out the rest of the shortlisted titles on the Poetry Translation Center's website. Um, it's been a pleasure to host you all this evening.